Man, finished off the coffee. Ah, oh, well. Let's get underway. Here we are from Chapter 7, Section 2. We're going to talk about marine ecosystems. The topic, marine ecosystems, your essential question. What are the primary threats to the coral reef and why? Now, when we talk about marine ecosystems, we are basically going to run through these things from right at the shore, out, and then we're going to kind of talk at the uh, Arctic regions right at the very end. So let's start with coastal wetlands. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on coastal wetlands because we really address wetlands when we just talked about freshwater ecosystems, and there's no real difference. It's just that it's coastal. It's going to be covered by salt water all or part of the time. So especially with the tides, a lot of time it comes in, they're underwater, the tide goes out, and it dries out a little bit. Same as the normal wetlands, lots of wildlife in there, uh, fish in it and out, birds coming in, clams, etc. They're absorbing a lot of excess rain. If we have floods, it's a low-lying area. So coastal wetlands, uh, once again, just in a broad term, very similar to freshwater. The only difference is the type of organisms we find there because of the salinity, more salty water, and it tends to be in that brackish because sometimes we get fresh, sometimes we get salt. So let's go in and go ahead and talk about estuaries. First real key term, which is specific. Estuary, this is where fresh water meets the ocean water, basically where a river is dumping into the sea. Right there at the mouth of the river where it's dumping into the sea, this is an estuary. Now, currents form because of this, and it's incredibly mineral rich because the river is constantly dumping new minerals, new nutrients into the ocean right there. Now, those dissolved nutrients tend to drift down to the bottom. Once again, mineral rich stuff settles down to the bottom and this is available to the producers that are there, so we tend to get a lot of plants growing at an estuary. Shallow, light reaches the bottom, heavy nutrients, and we get lots of plant growth. Plant growth attracts other organisms to come and live in it, and this attracts larger organisms, and we get this whole massive ecosystem. Very productive because of all these fresh nutrients, whether it's minerals or food source, etc coming in for it and trying to find protection from these harsh waves that come in and get hit, etc. Now, plants and animals of the estuary. Lots of light for photosynthesis. It's a shallow area right near the shoreline. Plenty of nutrients for both the plants and the animals. So we get large populations of rooted plants as well as plankton. Remember, plankton are the drifters, and we get lots of plankton in this area. Some of it's coming down from the river, others there from the ocean, and the plankton in turn provide food for small fish, then get eaten by larger animals such as dolphins, manatees, otters, etc. You name it. We also find a lot of oysters and clams anchored to the rocks. Once again, heavy in nutrients. Oysters and clams are filter feeders. They're sucking the water in and they're filtering out anything that's there. Basically, they're filtering out plankton, etc., from the water in order to eat. And then with the clams, etc., otters really love to eat the clams. That's their food of choice. So once again, you get all this stuff in there, brings in the larger organisms, which are eating the smaller organisms. We have this massively healthy life system. Now, organisms that live here do have to tolerate variations in salinity because salt water is meeting fresh water. Some organisms are coming down and they hit the salt water and they try and move back. The same with others. But anything that lives there year-round has to be able to deal with it, obviously. They have to be adapted for salt, a lot of salt, very little salt, or something in between. Estuaries oftentimes actually pr provide protected harbors. This gives us access to the ocean and to the rivers. So because of this, a lot of our larger port cities have been built at estuaries. New York, New Orleans, Jacksonville. These are all cities that are sitting right on an estuary, right where a river meets the sea. New York, the Hudson River, Jacksonville, 
we have the St. John's pouring into it, and New Orleans, obviously, the Mississippi River. These provide access for a boat to go up into the river, drop off goods, what have you. Because the river keeps dumping in, it tends to create a deeper place, nice port. So lots of our cities are at some of these, which takes us right into threats to the estuaries. Some of the major threats are because they're so heavily populated. And because they were so heavily populated for a long time, we just used the rivers as places to dump. And a lot of time the waste filled up and it kind of got bad. In America, we've gotten much better about controlling our waste, cleaning our water before we dump it. But this isn't true everywhere in the world. So estuaries are still places that are threat. And just the high level of population near these estuaries still creates a problem. Whether it's sewage, pesticides, fertilizers, any kind of our toxic chemicals. We have factories, plants around these big cities. As we've looked at Superfund sites before, we realize these chemicals can get into the ground and then they can obviously leach into the water system. Now, a lot of these pollutants will break down over time and wetlands tend to be really good at cleaning up pollutants. The problem is the estuaries often can't keep up with the amount of pollutants that come from dense populations. Once again, we're spraying pesticides at our house to keep the mosquitoes or whatever down. That washes into the river and it's killing plankton as well. Small organisms, it's the same thing. So a lot of times just our population at them causes problems for us as well. Let's move a little farther out, sort of, we're gonna talk about salt marshes. So the estuary is right where the water meets the sea. Salt marshes, once again, these are going into a generic wetland, but specifically marshes. They have what? Woody plants or non-woody plants? Yeah, marsh, non-woody plants. So mainly it's gonna have grasses, sedges. Sedges are a lot like grass, they're kind of triangular in their uh, leaf shape, et cetera. But these are obviously prone to periodic flooding and we find them mainly throughout the temperate and subarctic regions. Here in Gainesville, we are right on the line between tropic and temperate. So we actually have salt marshes here. We can find mangrove swamps just below us, which we'll get to in a minute, which tend to be tropical, and we can find salt marshes right where we are and right above us in Georgia, North, South Carolina. So we get a little bit of both worlds here. The salt marsh provides an amazing community of things, whether it's clams, aquatic birds, crabs come in, shrimp, and my favorite, the salt marsh mouse, <laughs> which you can see a picture of him up here. I've seen these up in the marshes near St. Augustine before. Kind of cool, they kind of high, they'll burrow in their little things and pop out. But anyway, loads of life in these marshes. Remember, they're only underwater part of the time. Lots of the time they're not, and things find areas to get into. These also absorb a lot of pollutants. They're really good at that. Once again, or marshes. So it's lots of green, weedy plants. They take it, even if they die quickly, something else is really ready to come back up, and they're clearing pollutants out of the water, carrying on a huge uh, ecological service for everybody. That's going to take us to the mangrove swamps. Now, swamps, once again, remember woody stems. The mangroves, we see these if you go off, especially to the Gulf Coast side, a little calmer, but we see lots of mangrove swamps there, just like the picture of the swamps. These are woody stems, so they root down, they can tolerate the salt water, obviously. They grow right at the salt water edge, and it's this little tree, this little forest, if you will, of the mangroves. These help protect the coastline from erosion. All the roots down in there keep things from washing out, or as the dirt comes, it gets hung up in all of the root structure. And they also protect inland from storms, because when the big waves come, they kind of have to come through the mangroves, and it disperses most of the energy of the big waves, so it really protects the inland area. Mangrove swamps are home to like over 2,000 animal species. Here's my favorite. Yeah, the uh, sloth. We find sloths in the tropical regions usually, and we find them in the mangrove swamps. So my sloth, one of the favorite, one of my favorite creatures out there. Pretty funny. 
but unfortunately a lot of our swamps have been filled with waste as well. This is kind of tangled knot of trees and roots, so we toss plastic bags out, they make their way down the river into the swamps and they get tied up into these root structures. We've got loads of plastic and other things. And a lot of our mangrove swamps around the world have actually been destroyed because of, sometimes we're just cutting them down because we want to live there and other times it's happening just because of all of this trash and pollution going into them creates a problem. This will take us to rocky and sandy shores. So the mangrove swamps are right in it and now we get to our rocky and sandy shores. Now here in Florida, when we think of the beach, we think of the sandy shores. And most of our Atlantic side is that, mainly sandy shores. There are a few areas, especially near the Gulf Coast, where we have some rocky areas. And then our Gulf Coast side tends to be more in the mangrove swamps and marshes. There, you get up around the Panhandle, we get back into some sandy shore areas as well. Rocky shores of the United States, we find more of them sort of way up north and also on the west coast has a lot of rocky shore. Now we get them here. If you've ever been to Sanibel Island, one side of Sanibel has this sandy shore and the other side kind of has a marsh and rocky shore. If you just want to go hang out at the beach, you go to one side. If you want to see all kinds of crabs and living things and wildlife, you go to the other side. Rocky shores tend to have more plants and animals because the rocks provide somewhere anchor for seaweed, places for crabs or things to hide, etc. So rocky shores tend to have much more wildlife. So like I say, you go down to Sandoval, I think it's the south side, which has sandy shore, but then the north side, once again, more of this rocky and lots of wildlife, etc. Now, sandy shores obviously dry out when the tide goes out. The tide comes in and it's all wet and the tide goes out and this area dries off. So animals have to adapt to this edge of drying and getting ex low exposure during low tide. So this is just something they've had to adapt to, but it's a difference and not everything can do that. Only something well suited to this covered in water, no water, can survive these regions. We also have one of your vocab words, a barrier island. Now along Florida, we have barrier islands all over the place, more in the Gulf Coast and really along the Atlantic side, but a barrier island is any island that's parallel to shore, and so you have the island here and then the shore here, like the picture back here. Now the Grand Banks in America off of North Carolina are kind of classic famous barrier islands. The storm comes and the island takes the brunt of the storm and by the time the waves make the mainland, they're much calmer because all the energy has been dispersed at Barrier Island. So these things tend to really help protect inland or mainland. And a lot of times you'll have really nice homes on the mainland side in front of a Barrier Island because they get protected from damage more. This will take us on out, so after the shore we're going to move on out and what we run into first typically are going to be coral reefs. Coral reefs are limestone ridges that we only find in tropical climates. They're composed of coral fragments that get deposited around the organic remains of other organisms. Coral are actually little animals. Now thousands of species of plants, whether it's seaweed, all kinds of stuff growing there and animals live in these cracks and crevices of the coral, making the coral reef some of the most diverse ecosystems on earth. Uh, one of my students one year said, so like the coral reefs over the rainforest of the ocean, and they really are. Our most diverse area on land is the rainforest, the most diverse area in the sea are the coral reefs. Most ecologically diverse that's there. Biodiversity is amazing there. Now corals themselves are actually predators. They're little polyps. You can see on the picture back here where it zooms in, we have this coral and it's hard and it's sharp if you ever bump up against it. But inside of that are little teeny tiny polyps, uh, kind of like stinging nettles, almost like tiny jellyfish. They come out and anything comes by, they sting them and they grab and eat. Mainly they're eating plankton, things of this nature, but they eat anything. The phytoplankton or zooplankton that floats too close or gets in too close to the reef, 
This is what the corals are actually eating. If you take a look at the graph or the chart back here, we see where we find the coral reefs. Once again, they're in tropical waters. They're close to shore because they have to have enough light. They can only live in clear, warm water where we have enough light for photosynthesis. So clear and warm, it's got to be close to the 30 parallel between 030 north, 030 south. We see them all along. All around across Florida, as we focus and look in on Florida, out into the Pacific, Hawaii, down in the South Pacific, lots of them. And some of those are just atolls. There's not much there except for the coral reefs. And you go back over to uh, Asia, Indonesia, and Australia. Great barrier reef out there. But once again, they're all found within this 30 parallel. 30 north, 30 south, because we find them in the tropics, only in the tropics. Now, coral reefs are very productive ecosystems. Unfortunately, they're very fragile. If the water surrounding them gets too hot or too cold, or the fresh water drains into coral, like if we have a runoff somewhere and we get too much fresh water, the coral can die. They have a very narrow range of tolerance, heat-wise, salinity-wise, and they have to be very clear because they're eating the phytoplankton. It gets cloudy, they don't survive either. So the water gets cloudy by muddy, possibly runoff, algal blooms, anything of this nature. It gets polluted, too high in nutrients. Once again, then the algae that live can either grow out of control or die. And if it grows out of control, it tends to kill the corals. So our coral reefs are incredibly productive but at the same hand, they're incredibly fragile. Not to mention things like oil spills, whether it's from drilling or boats coming by, sewage, pesticide, just silt runoff, dirt running off into the river and then pulling out. Like the picture we see here, you can see this overhead of that runoff spilling out into the ocean that gets out into our coral reefs and they can die. Overfishing devastates fish populations. We do a lot of fishing near the coral reefs because they're so high in populations of organisms. And we overfish, it upsets the balance of the feeding system. The food web gets disturbed and it causes problems throughout. One of the big problems is coral grows very slowly, like about two centimeters a year. So it's a very long, slow growth. For a brain, you go out and you go snorkeling, you see this giant brain coral. Well, it's taking hundreds, if not thousands of years for that thing to grow to that size. And they can die off pretty quickly when we have any of these changes, pollutants, etc., making it into the water. And a lot of times, like you can see here, it's just careless divers. Uh, divers, you know, wanting to, they stand on the coral and this kills the coral off because it's a living organism. Uh, ships drop anchor, go fishing, hits in the coral, tears it up. Shipwrecks, people just breaking some of it off some for decorative or even for building. You know, it's one thing when a piece washes up on shore to collect it. It's another to go off and break it off of the actual coral reef, but We've had this happen in a lot of cases. People make kind of like furniture or decorations in their homes from them. So we're gonna move from the coral reefs out into the ocean. Now when we talk about open ocean, that's an actual term. That means you're out in the boat and where's land? Open ocean is way out at sea. Most of our coral reefs are still kind of within eyesight of land. Not always, but they're not usually real far out. Depends on the continental shelf. Once that continental shelf dips, we're in open ocean. Now you look around and you see nothing but water, where cruise ships go, if you will. Now in the open ocean, light can only penetrate about 100 meters into the ocean. Think a football field. Now 100 meters would be closer to like the back of the end zone to the back of the end zone. But anyway, that's about the extent that light can penetrate. So most of the life out in the open ocean is concentrated in the shallow coastal waters where light can reach all the way down to the bottom then we can get growth on the bottom etc you get out in the open ocean it only penetrates a little bit so 
phytoplankton only grow where there's enough light and nutrients. It's only about this first hundred meters or so. So the open ocean, even though it's huge, is one of the least productive of all our ecosystems. Now there's still a lot of life there because it's so massive. But if we talk about per square kilometer, there is much less life in a square kilometer of the open ocean as opposed to near shore. There per square kilometer we find a lot of life and organisms. The sea's smallest herbivores are the zooplankton. Uh, zooplankton. These guys are like jellyfish, little teeny tiny shrimp, the floating things. These zooplankton are eating the phytoplankton. Teeny tiny little herbivores. We think of herbivores like rabbits, deer, but these things are microscopic. The fish then come in to feed on the plankton. So we've got the phytoplankton, zooplankton eating that, tiny little fish coming in to eat them, larger fish eating them, uh, dolphins and killer whales coming in to eat them. You know, this whole kind of web of life, if you will. Now, the top of the ocean is where we have some light. Phytoplankton can be there, so other things come in. The, the bottom of it gets pretty dark. We don't find as much here. So you have the top surface, we have a deep dark layer, and then right at the bottom where our decomposers are, our benthos, right, live here. Now we find a lot of things on the bottom because everything up here dies. When it dies, it drifts down to the bottom. So, the types of organisms that we find in the ocean layers at various depths depends on available sunlight. We find our plant matter up near the top, so we find some things for them. Some things live in this dark area, and they kind of go up and feed and come back down. Others live at the very bottom, where they are just grabbing the food that's down there. So from the picture you can see, we kind of have this littoral zone, if you will, right near the shore. We get lots of growth there. And then as we move out, we kind of get less and less, but we find different organisms depending on our depth and typically talking about life. The oceans, threats to our oceans, if you will. They are steadily becoming more and more polluted. For so long, we've looked at the oceans as just this immense, inexhaustible resource. But our population has grown and our ability to produce waste has grown to the point that runoff from fertilizers, industrial waste, and just sewage being dumped directly into rivers, that dumps directly into the ocean, has been some of our biggest sources of just pollution and waste going into the ocean. Overfishing has also caused lots of problems. Some of our fishing ability, our technology as such, we have nets that are miles long. We put them out and pull and pull in these massive catches. And even though it's illegal, when these nets become damaged beyond repair, well, they're really a miles long net. You roll it up, it's still big and heavy. And the captain's trying to make a profit. So he's kind of like, the net's gone. If we bring it back to shore, we're gonna have to pay to throw it away. These things are so big, it costs them thousands of dollars to throw it away. So they just cut it, leave it out in the ocean because they're gonna have to buy a new one anyway. It's illegal, but they still do it. The captain kind of says, hey, everybody gets a $500 bonus if nobody says anything, cut the nets and let it go. And everybody, hey, I'm happy to take $500 to not say anything. It's illegal, but it happened. I'm not saying all boat owners are bad, but it's just something that does occur. Now from here, we're gonna go from the open ocean up to the Arctic and Antarctic. So we're going up to the North Pole, the Arctic, and Antarctic, the South Pole. Now these areas are very rich in nutrients because of surrounding land mass. Uh, the Arctic is getting the land mass of kind of upwards Canada, Siberia, et cetera, and the water washes off and it goes in and seeps down. It's fairly nutrient rich. And then there is a land mass at Antarctica. It's an actual continent. So the North Pole is an ice cap only, no land underneath it, but the Antarctic has land. These fish out there are food for the birds, the whales, the seals, all this other stuff that's out there, including our friends, the polar bears up in the north. We have penguins down in the south, typically. But the Arctic ecosystems depend on the marine ecosystems because all the food comes from the ocean up there. Everything, everything's eating. You can't, there's no plants up there. Everything's coming from the ocean. 
nutrients wash into the ocean, but all the food source and life is from the ocean. Ice, ice, no plant. Fish and seals then provide food for polar bears and for people up on the land, etc. Now the Antarctic South Pole, this is the only continent that's never been colonized by humans. It's actually governed by an international commission and it's really just used for research. So different countries have research stations out there, but it's not a colonized. It doesn't belong to any country. It's not its own country. Different countries just have some stations and buildings down there doing some research. And even at the summertime, it is a landmass. During summer, enough of the ice melts back and we do get a few plants growing right along the edge of the continent during summer. It's just not much and it doesn't last long. Also, people are only there during the summer, spring, and summertime. During winter, nobody stays there year round, but at least it's incredibly unusual. So just like in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, plankton form this basis of the Antarctic food web. So they're nourishing the whales, the fish, the birds and then the penguins that live there as well. So we get to the Arctics, all the food source comes from the ocean, nutrients go in. Guys, that wraps it up for chapter seven, talking about the aquatic ecosystems. Take care. Man, I'd have some coffee, but I'm out. <laughs> Take care, we'll see you next time.